Hello, welcome to the programme. We're on BBC Two and the BBC News Channel until 11 this morning. Throughout the morning, we'll bring you the latest breaking news and developing stories as ever. And as always, we're keen to hear from you on all the issues we're covering today. Don't forget, texts will be charged at the standard network rate. We're particularly keen to hear your views today on this question, which you'll hear regularly over the next few months. Will the UK be better off in or out of the European Union? David Cameron is going to Parliament this afternoon to present his argument for Britain to remain in the EU. The Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, who is tipped as a future leader of the Conservative Party, has been setting out his arguments for why he'll be campaigning for out. But ultimately it's you, the great British public, who will decide the future of Britain's relationship with the EU when you get to vote in a referendum on Thursday the 23rd of June. In the meantime, you can have your say on our programme. Do get in touch in all the usual ways. Well, with us this morning, our very own political guru, Norman Smith, and also a group of voters. And uh, all of you, just introduce yourselves qu quickly. Tell us who you are and which side of the debate you're on. Um, I'm Holly, I'm a student, and I'm firmly fit in for freedom of movement. My name's Kate Faulkner, and I'm actually neutral. I don't think it'll make a blind bit of difference if we stay in <laughs> or stay out. My name's Rugari, and I'm definitely in because the argument for exit is not coherent and will lead us into a nightmare, I feel. I'm Darren and I'm excited for the opportunities that we'll have being part of a truly global community after leaving the European Union. I'm Alexandra, I'm so convinced that leaving is the right thing to do that I wouldn't hold a referendum, I'd leave tomorrow. Hello, I'm Hannah, I'm a student, I'm pro-EU um, because I think that our argument is fundamentally flawed and I think staying in will help protect human rights. Hi, I'm Nigel. Um, I'm uh, definitely an outer. Um, I believe that uh, rather than a leap in the dark, uh, it's actually a step towards a golden future and uh, I can't believe how exciting that's going to be. OK, well, we'll uh, hear a lot more from you in a few moments. But first of all, before we carry on with the debate, uh, Norman is with us. And Norman, just remind ourselves exactly what David Cameron has negotiated. Well, Joanna, David Cameron travelled thousands of miles. He had 48 hours of intense negotiations and eventually he came up with this deal. Three key elements to it. First key element is on immigration. Now, what he's got is an agreement that EU migrants who have come to Britain will no longer get automatic access to the full level of tax credits. In future, they'll have to wait four years because before they can get the full tax credits. But there's another issue he was concerned about, and that is the practice at the moment where some EU migrants claim child benefit for children living back in their home country in Poland or Hungary or whatever. He wanted to stop that. He hasn't quite got that. What instead he's got in his agreement that in future, for new migrants, that will be index linked to the cost of living in their country. And for existing migrants here, well, they'll only get it for another four years. Second key area where he's got a deal is on safeguarding the city. Mr Cameron is concerned that the city is going to be bossed around by the Eurozone, that the Eurozone is going to cramp the city style with a whole load of new banking regulations. What he's got is a sort of an agreement that if he's concerned, if the city's concerned, we can put up a hand and say, hey, 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 that's not good for us. But what he can actually do about it is not clear beyond instigating a debate amongst European leaders. And the last Critical area concerns the power of Parliament. How much power do we actually have in Parliament? How much have we handed over to Brussels? How many of our laws are now coming from Brussels? Well, what Mr Cameron has got is called a red card. And with this red card, what it means is if we don't like some EU legislation, in a pretty limited area, it has to be said, but if we don't like a bit of EU legislation, we can club together with 16, it's an awful lot, 16 other EU countries and say, no, we don't want it. We can stop it. That is the deal. OK, we'll have some more from you in a moment, Norman, the arguments for in and out, but let's just quickly get a flavour from the audience. A good deal? Kate, what do you think? I think it's some extra deals. I think we forget there's a huge element of us being in the EU, which is good. Um, I think the right for the City of London to stay out and of the banking rules is good because we are very different elsewhere. Um, I do think that um, us being able to come out of some of the rules is also a good idea, but having said that, I think we're pretty rubbish at implementing them anyway, so um, I don't think that helps us so much. Um, for me, the big thing was being able to have the pound recognised, I think, um, and that was, that was most important, that we don't have to go in the euro, and we do not have to bail other countries out. Hannah. 
Um, I think the deal that's been negotiated is focused on is focusing on the wrong areas. Boris Johnson yesterday said that coming out will be the best thing for British people, and I think that capping migrant benefits does actually does more to demonise stigma against immigrants and also against refugees. Um, and if he actually wants to help British people, he should focus more on negotiating the unilateral trade deal with China, because. Um, Cheap imports of steel, for, exa for example, are jeopardising entire communities in Wales. And there are so many jobs that are dependent in Port Talbot on the steel um, industry. And because of the cheap imports from China, um, they are now at risk. The people in Wales are at risk of losing those jobs. And it's not just the people who work in that area, in the steel community. It's one in four jobs. Um, in that community, such as the people who work in the sandwich shops or the truck drivers, those jobs also depend on that on that industry existing. And to get rid of something like that isn't okay. N Nigel, you said you cannot wait yeah. for a new future. I, I, you, I assume, therefore, there is nothing that David Cameron could have negotiated that well, would have changed your view. Well, what he's done is he's got a deal that nobody wanted, mm -hmm. nobody asked for. Um, uh, this is a deal around or, or on based around a Norway, Sweden type deal, when actually what we're really talking about is becoming a global trading hub in the future. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had 40 years of marriage to um, the European Union, um, and uh, it's like uh, David David Cameron's gone for um, some sort of marriage counselling, but actually what we really want is a divorce. <laughs> OK, you know? well, let's, let's uh, check back in with Norman then to run us through the, the main arguments on either side, Norman. Joanna, thanks uh, very much. Well, we've kind of cut through all the rhetoric to get to five basic arguments at the centre of this debate. I suppose the most emotive one centres on immigration. Now, those who want to stay in say, Immigration is good for business. Business is crying out for EU workers, particularly big business. But also you think of uh, the health service, the farming sector, the service sector. You want to get a leaky tap fi fix? Well, probably going to be a Polish plumber. Those who want to get out say, we've lost control of our borders. We don't know who's coming in or out because if we're in the EU, we have no control over EU migrants coming in here. There's nothing we can do. It's part of the EU rules, and that's why immigration is going up and up and up. Second key area is around security. Now, the Prime Minister has made much of this. It's almost the centrepiece of his argument. His view is that we can cooperate with other European countries to counter terrorism, to counter criminality and actually we are safer staying in a bigger block. Those who want to leave, and we heard from Ian Duncan Smith yesterday, say actually we're perhaps more at risk of a Paris style attack because we don't have control of, of, over our borders. We can't stop terrorists trying to come here. We're less able to police our own borders. I suppose for many people one of the deciding issues will be jobs. Now, those who want to stay in say, hang on a sec, around three million jobs are tied up with our membership of the European Union. We would be barking mad to put those at risk. Those who want to get out say, actually, there'd be a jobs boom if we went because we wouldn't be snarled up in endless regulation and red tape and small business in particular would find a new lease of life without being burdened with all that extra EU regulation. Let's look at trade. Now, those who want to stay in say, well, it gives us access to the biggest single market in the world without any sort of barriers at all. No tariffs for us. We can trade quite freely. And roughly about 40, 45% of our trade is with the European Union. So come on, why would you want to put that at risk? Those who want to get out say, don't be silly. Of course, we can negotiate new deals with other European countries. And think about it. They trade more with us than we trade with them, so they are going to want to keep trading with us. So if we pull that, expect the boss of Volkswagen or Mercedes to be straight on the blur to Mrs Merkel saying, for goodness sake, get a deal with the Brits. Lastly, the city. Now, the city is one of the key elements in this whole debate. And the argument of Mr Cameron is the dominance of the city will be put at risk if we get out and that big banks will maybe move. Indeed, Michael Heseltine said if we, if we left, Frankfurt and Paris would be running up the flag to celebrate at the demise of the city. Those who want to get out say, come on, 
The city is a global power base. It doesn't have to depend on being part of the euro. It deals with countries around the world. It is scaremongering. But those are kind of the five key arguments which will probably shape this debate. Thank you, Norman. Norman's going to come and join us with the audience, uh, going to be our unofficial fact checker. So if uh, any of you come up with any particular Gosh. porkies, Norman will be <laughs> stepping in. Um, let's uh, bring in the audience. So um, we were hearing there, obviously, all the key arguments. Just each of you shout out which is the key issue for you. Freedom. Trade. The economy. All Definitely. of them. Immigration. All of them. Definitely. Yeah. Um, to talk about the Paris style attacks. Hang, I think that's. Hang on, hang on. The head of Europol has said <coughs> that there are 3,000 to 5,000 trained Islamist fighters who have entered in the last 12 months. This is, this is an independent body. This is Europol. This is not the, cal this is not the Daily Mail. This is not Cameron. I think this is uh, scaremongering. I'm sorry. Ian Duncan Smith. That's not yes. verifiable, really, is it? it? How, hang on. Are you, the head of, are you the head of the European Chief of Police Body? No other intelligence agencies Smith. back that up, have they? So. Well, exactly, exactly. ISIS themselves have said that they intended to use the free movement of people to flood Europe with ISIS fighters. <laughs> now, oh, now, now, whether they were as successful as they intended or not, the truth is, if you have no borders and you have no controls, then there is a risk. Yeah, right, well, I'm, 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 I'm keen to, to bring Norman in at this point, just to try to cut through some of these statistics that we're talking about. Right. Norman, you come and join us. Um, the politicians are now coming out on, on both sides of this. Yeah. Theresa May, Home Secretary, saying one of her key reasons now for voting to stay in is yeah. security. Yeah. Then you've got Ian Duncan Smith saying staying in makes us more vulnerable. I mean, my kind of take on it is this, that countries which are in the European Union and countries which are out of the European Union are all vulnerable to IS attacks because, you know, this is an organisation which will find ways of getting around your controls, whether you're in a union or whether you're out of a union. So I understand the arguments they're making, but I don't think they're sort of a key argument on either side because, you know, you're dealing with people who are so determined and so organised, mm. I think they'd probably get round whatever you had in place. It's a much more sort of profound existential threat. OK, let's, let's um, turn our attention to immigration because that's often right at the top of uh, voters' lists. Any who, who feels that that's, that's at the top? I'd very much leave to go um, leave the European Union, but I'm not opposed to immigration whatsoever. But what we should have is an Australian-style point system where we can judge everyone from the rest of the world on their merits, just as we do with Europe. I find it absolutely shocking that just because someone isn't from within the European Union, they have, uh, we have a tariff, um, not a tariff, sorry, we have a, a cap on how many people can come. This is so, so damaging for businesses in London. So what do you think about figures then on immigration? Because obviously the, the, the nature of the debate about being in the EU is that it's very difficult to limit numbers. I, I think that we should have control and we should be able to decide as a country, not imposed by Brussels on, on, our, on the rules for our borders. Personally, I think we should look at every individual case on their own merits and, who, and what, we need for the, uh, what we need for the businesses, as opposed to saying, ah, oh, European, crack on, come on in. If you think yeah, we should be able to decide as a country, then why are you against a referendum? Huh? If you think we should be able to decide as a country, then why are you against a referendum? Because I think the fear-mongering is going to be so much, and there'll be so much money put in by Cameron and by the e, the e propaganda, but that the fear, there'll be so much fear and so, so few facts. But for you to say that there will be an increase in Paris style attacks is fear mongering. It is scare mongering. No, I'm saying what the head of Europol said. That's not my opinion. That's what the head of the European police. Like. So, what's your opinion? I, I don't know. I can't let, say. Let, let's bring in Begari. Begari wanted to come in on immigration. We'll stick with immigration. The, the, the fact moment. with immigration is that, for example, you've got more Brits living in Spain than Spaniards living in the UK. You've got more UK uh -huh. citizens claiming state benefits in Germany than Germans claiming state benefits and in the expats UK. And not immigrants. So, it's a very skewed argument. Oh, and I think one that's been sort of tailored to pander to that sort of xenophobic element of the Leave EU campaign. It's worth, uh, it's worth pointing out also that, you know, we tend to talk about immigration in the EU context, but roughly half of our immigration is actually non-EU. Now, why that matters is because there we do have control. We should be able to do something about it, but still that immigration has increased. So it raises a question mark. If we pulled out, would we really be able to control immigration? And one of the things David Cameron floated the other day was would other EU countries say, well, we're not going to bother keeping EU migrants in Europe as we do at the moment in Calais and Dunkirk? In other words, we'll just say, 
go on through to Britain. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me something which the sort of outside have got to try and answer. I object to the xenophobic comment yeah. because um, actually it's not about that, it's about numbers. Uh, and it's very simple. 300,000, 350,000 last year people came to this country. You cannot plan an economy, a country, an infrastructure yeah, how many to cope with continent? that number. You know, look at schools, look how at hospitals, look continent? at um, uh, 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 housing. All of these factors are driven by an uncontrolled amount of immigration and at the moment with like, open borders you've got a potential not 500 million people we haven't heard from Darren and you, think, you are out Darren. yes I am yes quite firmly I think that the average voter doesn't care about numbers doesn't know numbers I think that it's the principle of not having control not having a say in how much money needs to go in education how much money needs to go to local authorities in order that. to plan I, yeah. I think that it's perfectly reasonable for voters, which this is a very high issue on the agenda, um, to be concerned about having no control over um, immigration whatsoever from the European Union. I think that's But the EU reasonable. don't set budgets for education in this country. No, they don't, but we have no... Our crumbling we have, we infra our infrastructure so isn't the fault of the EU. Hang on, they do set but, the but you're though. assuming that if we take back control of our borders, we'll be able to control them. Mm. We, and actually, we're pretty rubbish at that. Because as Norman is quite right, where we can control them, we've been rubbish. And it's exactly the same on the, everybody complains about the EU rules and regulations. We're absolutely dreadful on rules and regulations in this country. We either overdo it, ladders being particular in my industry, where we have ridiculous rules and regulations, but we're implemented far worse here than they are in any other European country. And then we don't have regulation that we actually need. Yes, so but... the problem is, is you're assuming that we have a government that can do the things that, Outside that you want. European and actually Union. they haven't proved that they're able to. So why would we have this magic though, Which has a mandate solution. to re um, redo health and safety well, policy. That, that's you can't okay. Do then, that from Brussels. Because they've well, never changed their minds when they've well, got let's into move, power, have they? <laughs> let's move on then to that to that issue of accountability and sovereignty. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Where I does think that that's rank jargon. Be? I think it's jargon. Why we, we are voters being able to vote for the people who Yeah, are, but we do. Yeah. The, the thing is, the statistics politicians talking about Britain having no political mm -hmm. sovereignty, the statistic for how many, how much of the EU legislation then directly impacts the UK is so variable. It's with, the argument is between 9% of legislation and 70% of legislation. It is complicated. I mean, I think around about 15% are actual regulations, so those are laws. But there's an awful lot of, uh, sorry, about 15% are directives, apologies, those are laws. But there's an awful lot of regulation on top mm. of that, which aren't necessarily laws but nevertheless do impact on business so you know the actual laws is probably about 15 percent but the amount of red tape there is an awful lot maybe up to 50 so, so the bureaucracy in this country is running at something like 33 billion as a direct result of eu legislation but also uh, if you look at uh, look just look at what david cameron has actually negotiated he hasn't got negotiated a deal in which he's going oh how exciting it is to be part of the european union he's actually d uh, uh, done a deal which says actually we don't want to be we want to keep you at arm's length uh, we want to control certain things so he's not saying i want to embrace the european union in fact he's trying to offer a deal that says, well, we'll state, we won't join the euro, we won't do this, we'll take some control under it. Yeah. It's an interesting point, because you say you're excited to leave. Is yeah. anyone but here really excited to stay, or is it <laughs> well, about the, the other... The you, you're the excited yeah. to yeah. stay, really tell us. everything about the EU, I think it's great. What? Yeah, what? because the bureaucracy... Let her speak. The bureaucracy is the price of living in society. That's bureaucracy, yes, when you no, have, when you have, not. sorry, when you have human beings working together and um, communicating, there's never going to be perfect communication efficiency, because we're not mind readers we spend and we're not millions perfect. millions of pounds shipping from Brussels to Strasbourg, the Parliament. What, why do we need that? That's the unneeded bureaucracy to keep the French happy, to keep them feeling supreme. I personally haven't read a single bureaucracy. economic paper that vouches for the credentials of us leaving the EU. Not a single one. School of Economics. So we would have the freedom to make new trade deals with South Korea, with China, know, I think with Brazil. I, I think there's a slightly Look, delusional you know, sense of Britain's class in the 21st well century. In the part of what David that. Cameron negotiated, right, was the, um, was the ability to um, not have any future bailouts. Well, that's a real great faith in the European Union. <laughs> but as, well, actually, we already bail them out. We bail them out to the tune of £16 billion a year, because yeah. that's what our contribution is for a negative trade deal. Um, 
I mean, we must be crazy to carry on with this uh, 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 contribution when we've got people in this country that are uh, 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 surviving on food so banks. That's, that's a Victorian uh, era as far as I'm concerned. Talk now about deal with Europe. You think it's a good idea to yeah, leave? Absolutely. Oh, I can't wait. Please, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> Let's talk about the personalities involved. Boris Johnson, does that change things? Yes, absolutely. I think young people, he resonates with young people mm. quite well. I think he's going to infuse people, get them excited about the prospect of leaving. And I think that he's going to do wonders for our side. I'm a, I'm a young person here, absolutely does not resonate with me. Wow. Who, uh, who uh, resonates with you? Because actually, at the, start, at the very start yeah, Jeremy of Corbyn. Uh, <laughs> the campaigns, you were, well, before the referendum date was announced, you were um, undecided, weren't you? What well, made your mind up? Or well, not necessarily before the referendum date not was announced. Much. It was before the debate started, because I don't think there's that much... I don't think people know that much about the EU, but once you read into it, I just think that, for me, the humanitarian aspect of it and preserving human rights is so you much more... You make it sound like Britain never had human rights exactly. policy before no, joining I mean, the European Union. No, but That's I mean, ridiculous. So I mean, the Human Rights Act didn't exist. Yes, it did. And coming out of... No, it didn't. Yes, no, no, it absolutely no, but did we not. We were the UN Convention on Human Rights in 1951. We had human rights in this country. We don't need Brussels to tell us how to treat people decently. Yeah, but hold on Why a minute. Why are we so Brussels are just then? telling us without some input. I, I used to work so the whole the we whole are, point yeah. of the idea the that, oh, they just tell us what to do and we have to sit and vote, OK. The whole point the is, is that we can actually put our point across. And when you ever want to change something, and, and changes are required in the EU, I do agree, the administration and the delivery and the return that it gives isn't the best, and that has. But when you want to change something, you don't change it by leaving. You have but to change you, by being with it. You can't change you it try because we're one out. of 28. Exactly. But we and can. equally so. It. They're going in their own direction. It's a direction Absolutely. that we don't want yeah. to go in. Even, right. the, even the Remainer can't say we don't want to go in that direction. We've negotiated that. We don't have to remember. We're at the start of what's going to be quite a, a long campaign. <laughs> Four months, June 23rd. Everyone will have their say. And uh, you can watch David Cameron making his case to MPs live on the BBC News Channel at half past three this afternoon. Later on in the programme, we'll be getting reaction to the referendum from Europeans living in this country. And we'll also speak to the former Defence Secretary, Liam Fox, a leading member of the OUT campaign. So stay with us for all of that and keep on getting in touch with your thoughts as well, all the usual ways of getting in touch.